Thank you, everyone. And we're meeting, we were going to talk to you about freedom of speech and our use of language. And we think it's a nice uh, fit for UMR Connect's uh, program for this month. Fits in with the theme. And I am Dee Sable, and this is Vanjie Castro. Uh, so um, I guess the introduction, can you hear me OK, everyone out there? All right. So in my intro and the introduction, our, our person gave to us. Um, my bachelor's is in political science, and I am completing my master's in public administration. So talking about the First Amendment actually uh, is near and dear to my heart. I did take a year of um, constitutional law, so it was always really interesting for me. So this topic, I think, is very timely for what's uh, been happening in, in, in society, in our community, and also since it's election year. Um, so, at the Diversity Council, we believe that everybody has their own personal experiences, and when they come um, to the table, they come with their own filters and their own beliefs, and we're not here to, do, to change that. We're here to um, help you understand how to better communicate with people who have different communication styles, who have different backgrounds, um, and also to challenge you to think a little broader about the people that you interact with on a daily basis. So our objectives are to help you understand the impact of speech on your daily lives and the lives of those around us, and also to differentiate between the right to freedom of speech and the fact that our speech is not free from consequence. So we're going to talk first about the First Amendment. And this is the First Amendment. The Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution were designed to define the relationship between individuals and the government. And so they are set up to ensure that the government doesn't infringe on our rights. And the First Amendment, you can see here um, what is protected. So Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. We are going to focus on abridging the freedom of speech and of the press to some extent. When it comes to personal expression, we live free from government repraisal, and that is what the First Amendment provides us with, that we are free to speak or not to speak, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, without reprisal from the government. So we wanted to create a little context of how the First Amendment functions currently, and, and that's different than it was at the time that the First Amendment was written. So there have been legal interpretations and judicial struggles that help us to define and understand the limitations of the First Amendment. So um, the first is, you know, the government doesn't have a, a right to censor your speech, but they also don't have the right to force us to speak, and that is to utter an oath or a salute or those types of things. And that was actually a, a later legal interpretation that um, we have the right not to speak in this country if we choose. And there are still countries in the world where an oath or a pledge are required or a salute or those types of things. In the 20s, Gitlo, which was the case that this is referring to, defined that um, it isn't just at the federal level that the um, First Amendment applies, but that it applies to states as well. And prior to that, uh, states often had uh, legislation and other things that limited free speech. So some required you to do certain things or required that you didn't do other things. But in, the 25, in, in 1925, um, those laws were struck down by this Gitlow ruling, which extended equal protection under the law to the First Amendment. So of the things that we are, we are all, as citizens of the United States, um, receive equally, freedom of speech was interpreted to be one of those. There have been times in our history when political speech and, sp and political literature were um, either banned or restricted by the government. And you know, one of those times was during the Red Scare when communist literature was not allowed and was banned and, and um, not protected by the First Amendment. And you know, it's gone back and forth in different you know, eras of, the, of U.S. history. It's almost, uh, it seems very strange now to us, I think, to think about not having the right to express our political views. That's something we certainly have swung very far in the other direction on. 
And then there, there was also then legislation that defined what really is speech. And so burning of, of the U.S. flag was one thing that went all the way, you know, through the court system. And it was determined to be a symbolic act. And at that point, the First Amendment was expanded to include symbolic acts, symbolic speech, those types of things. And so there are different, you know, varieties of those, and some are protected and some are not. The burning of a draft card is not protected because it's a government document. The burning of a flag is protected because it's considered a symbolic act. The burning of a cross can go either way, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But so these are some of the contextual points for how we think about the First Amendment, Amendment today. Also, you know, some of the things in addition to, um, in addition just to legal interpretation, you know, there is public opinion that sways kind of how the First Amendment is interpreted. This is really difficult to see, but this is from a Pew, the Pew Trust, one of their, the Pew Research Center, one of their um, surveys that they did. And I think the main thing to take away from here is that by generation, people feel very differently about speech. So this is specifically about offensive statements about minorities and whether or not the government should play any role in curtailing that speech. So the greatest generation, 12% of the greatest generation says the government should play a role in that. Extremely low. Coming from that sense that speech is ours and it doesn't need government regulation. At the same time, 80% of that generation thinks that people have the right to say whatever they want publicly. Yes. Age 70 to 87 is that generation. Thanks for asking that. Now I'm going to talk about millennials, and they are 18 to 34-year-olds. 40% of that population bracket believes that the government should have some say in whether or not people, you know, what people say about um, in, in a racial context. That seems extremely high and very far away from the, the greatest generation's viewpoint. Now some of that is just not really an understanding, we think, mm -hmm. we interpreted a little bit, talked a lot about this. We think part of that is just that generation not really understanding the role of government, perhaps, in the same way contextually that we do um, after our in lives with it. Go ahead. Did you think of the aspect of what it was like maybe 34 years ago? Absolutely. Yeah. It's at, uh, honestly, there's so much cultural and social context that goes into the viewpoints of these, of these just different generations. And I think you know, that's part of how they define what the age brackets are for the different generations. What I mean is, it's like, say, the younger generation 40 years ago, did they have a low or, or a higher thought of the, if the government should what they say. Like so, yeah, you can see in the middle, so Gen X and boomers. So that, that's after they got older. Though. That's right now, I mean, yeah. 40 years ago. Sure, and that's one of the things that we're extrapolating because that data doesn't exist, but we are extrapolating that, you know, we're, we're Gen X, and if when we were that age, we probably were like, oh, sure, why, why can't the government just tell us how to think or speak? And that would be just not understanding. And that's, again, that's just our interpretation. But you have to think about all of the context that goes into um, people's opinions and feelings about uh, Constitution and our rights and our civil interactions. But I think what you, you should think, of, what we should really look at and think about is that if 40% of millennials are, believe that um, the government should censor uh, offensive speech about minorities, then what is the next generation going to think or feel? Um, it's great to think about like 40 years ago and how did they feel when they were younger. If you do that, then you'd have the answer of what you're... <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but, and that's just one but factor, though. There are many other things, in, including... Um, you know, being at war in one of the, the world wars, being at war overseas, the other things that are going on in the political arena, where we are socially and economically, um, you know, all of those would be factors, not just the age of the population when they're surveyed, but I think lots and lots of factors. But it's just a good question to ask. I mean, we might not necessarily have the answers, but we can think about it. What mm -hmm. would it be like um, in the next 10 years when it comes to free speech? 
so from that, we are going to talk about speech in the modern world. Mm -hmm. So there's a quote that was in Slate by uh, Ted Cruz that political correctness is killing people. Uh, I think that's a really broad statement when you think about that. Is political correctness really killing people? Um, and what is political correctness? So we have a brief video, a little bit about that. Is, is PC, PC culture destroying freedom of speech? Nope. nope. From, From YouTube, YouTube comments to presidential, presidential candidates, it seems, it seems a, lot a lot of people, people think freedom, freedom of speech is under, under attack. attack. And, and who might, might I ask is to blame? blame? The guy God BC culture. culture. If, if you've, you've ever called out racism, racism sexism, ableism, ableism, or any other oppressivism, oppressivism you've, you've probably, probably been accused of being too PC. PC, PC is, is, of course, short, short for politically correct. correct. Political correctness is avoiding words or behaviors that exclude, marginalize, or insult groups of people who are socially disadvantaged or discriminated against. Basically, treating people with respect. respect. Now, now, if you, you ask, ask me, me that, that doesn't, doesn't sound, sound like a bad thing. thing. But, but a recent, recent poll by Fairleigh Dickinson University found that 68% of Americans and 81% of Republicans agreed that a big problem this country has is being politically correct. Even 62% of Democrats polled agreed that being PC was getting out of hand. For these folks, political correctness is synonymous with weakness or being overly sensitive. Similar to the new term social justice warrior, calling someone PC is a way to derail and dismiss conversations about inequality. Okay, PC police, you're just a by everything. everything. The term PC is almost always used as an insult. insult. Well, it's been around, around for a while, it gained popularity in the 80s when it caught on with conservatives, conservatives not liberals. So why, why is being PC used as an insult? insult? And what, if anything, does it have to do with free speech? speech? Here's, Here's the thing. thing. It's, it's not just about hurt feelings. feelings. It's, it's about calling out oppressive power structures, and that's where the misunderstanding, misunderstanding comes in. What's perceived as being too sensitive is usually someone speaking out against lazy, offensive language that doesn't usually get Challenge. That's because, because the group of people, people that those words hurt historically, historically haven't, haven't had the opportunities to have their voices, voices heard. And the, and the people, people who call that being too PC are often in privileged positions and don't want to or haven't had to think about what they're saying or the consequences that come with it. You can't take away my freedom of speech just because you're offended. Well, yeah. In America, freedom of speech simply means the government cannot prohibit you from expressing yourself. It's why you criticize Obama without being thrown in jail. But on an interpersonal level, freedom of speech does not mean freedom, freedem from consequences. consequences. Technically, no, no subject, subject on earth is off limits. limits. You can, can say whatever, whatever you want. But in, but in turn, turn, people are allowed to respond however they want. The, the fact that, that you can, can comment, comment means you're, you're not, not being censored. censored. If, you if you tell, tell a crappy sex joke, joke and someone says, hey, that, that was, was a crappy sex joke, joke. That's, that's freedom, freedom of speech. speech. And, and if you post, post some racist bullshit on Facebook, Facebook and your boss decides she doesn't, she doesn't want to employ people, people who spew racist, racist bullshit on Facebook, you, you still have freedom of speech. Of speech. And, and you're free, free to take that racist bullshit somewhere else. else. America. America. PC, PC culture, culture treating, treating others with respect, respect social, social justice, justice warriors, whatever, whatever you call it, is, is it prohibiting, prohibiting anyone's, anyone's freedom of speech. speech. It's, it's mainly about people standing up for themselves and asking to be spoken to and spoken about in a respectful way. way. In fact, political correctness is expanding free speech. We're adding, We're adding words to the dictionary every year in an, in an effort, effort to promote more inclusive, more inclusive and respectful speech. speech. Last, Last year alone, the OED added microaggressions, mansplaining, and a whole host of gender terms like cisgender, agender, and gender fluid to the dictionary. That, that seems, seems like giving more, more speech to, to more, more people, people not, not less. less. So, so have you ever been accused of being too PC, or, or maybe you've been thrown in jail for saying, saying the N-word? How, how do you still, still have internet access? access? Tell, Tell us about, us about it, it in the comments below, below and we'll see you next week right here on Decoded. In our last vlog. So, how we communicate with each other has changed dramatically because of social networking, because of technology. So. Um, what we consider free speech or censoring uh, may be different than what it was 20 or 40 years ago because of the internet, right? So you can post something on your Facebook or Twitter or whatever account, social networking account you have, and it go, can go all over the place. It, go, it can go to the other side of the world. Um, and we believe that uh, whatever we say doesn't affect or harm other people, but actually it does, depending on who it's geared to, right? So the idea of that what we say might not have any consequences actually is not true, right? We can say whatever you want, but we also have to be open to dealing with the consequences with the words that we speak. So 
This is the thing. Do you want to say any more about that? No. So I want to say yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things. It isn't just that it's reaching farther, but it's going faster, and it can't it can't be erased. So the things that end up out out in cyberspace, the comments or the memes, which are those little pictures with the funny messages in them, any of those types of things, they're not going to just disappear. Um, they can stay out there forever and be recirculated and recycled. The other important thing about that is a reader or a, a viewer of something that you've created or said doesn't necessarily have any context to go with that. They don't know who you are. What, where it might have come from, what kind of person you are, or what your intentions were when you said it. And without that context, there can be a lot more misunderstanding. So, I'll from there. Also, um, the way that we, uh, we interact on social networking, we haven't really kind of figured out rules, right? So we, we kind of, um, censor ourselves as we go along when uh, social networking, what, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate to post on Facebook. Some organizations had policies about how, what they would post on their social networking. Some organizations didn't even know that you could, you're supposed to have policies. And they had to figure it out as we go along. And so we're still trying to figure out how we're supposed to behave when it comes to the internet. Also, what the, what the government will, will censor um, on their internet, uh, mostly is terroristic threats explicit language, which is hate speech or violent speech, and that's really kind of up to interpretation, and also cyber stalking. So those are the three things that are covered legally that um, can, uh, is protected on, online. Not, not protected. Or not protected, yeah. Okay, cool. So I wanted to talk a little bit. We have been hearing a lot of things in the news about um, people's use of social media and how that affects their work. So we're going to talk about two different types of employees. Public employees, so employees that, that work for the government, anyone whose salary is funded by our tax dollars, when they're at work, they're considered an extension of the government. And they are bound by the rules of their workplace, which are generally very strict. And um, all of their speech is, is subject, whether it's online or anywhere, is subject to certain rules. When they're off the job, then they're accountable to perhaps their role or their level of attainment or position in, in a company or it within the government organization. And the test for that is generally, again, hasn't been legally tested all the way through the system yet, but the test for whether or not a statement is um, offensive in, and um, whether or not they can be fired or terminated or something have some other um, action against them is whether or not it's a common issue of public interest. So very broad, but if they're commenting on something and it's an issue of public interest, then their statements are a reflection of their job with the government. So imagine trying to, in the courts or even, you know, in your community, trying to determine or define what that means and what is um, a, an issue of public interest and what isn't. So we have a short video clip that kind of talks about a recent event locally or in, the, in Minnesota. A St. Paul police sergeant under scrutiny for a post on Facebook says he's extremely sorry. Sergeant Jeff Rothecker made the post on Saturday. It said drivers should run over protesters at the Black Lives Matter protest who are taking part in a march on Martin Luther King Day. In a statement today, he said he understands the post was insensitive and wrong. He also said, in part, my poor choice of words conveyed a message I did not intend and I am not proud of. As a law enforcement officer, I would never intentionally encourage someone to commit a crime. I very much regret my actions. Yesterday, Sergeant Rothecker resigned from the Minnesota Fraternal Order of Police. He is on leave as St. Paul Police continue to investigate the matter. So the outcome of that case has not yet been determined. There is a third party investigating the remarks and seeing um, you know, what type of repercussions there should be. Um, but he did uh, go out of the union. He left the union and is, you know, kind of waiting um, the outcome of what will happen with his position. So just one, uh, one example, he was not at work. He was in his private account when he made those remarks, but it still had a bearing on his position as a police officer serving and protecting the public. And that's kind of where that gray area is, but they're trying to define that now. So private employers, um, you know, Minnesota, like most states, is, a, is an 
uh, at will state for employment, which means that the uh, your employer has a lot of liberty, a lot of latitude with um, how they manage their employees and, and retain or not retain their employees, which means the consequences of this type of action. So again, you're in your private account uh, on social media or some other type of media, and you make a statement, and the consequences of, of that fall to your employer, and it's at their discretion what to do. And when their consideration is determining the effect on their brand or image or mission based on your statements or reactions to your statements. We have an example of that. Former anchor Wendy Bell was fired from her job at Pittsburgh's WTAE after an offensive comment on her Facebook page regarding the suspects wanted for the suburban Pittsburgh shooting that claimed the lives of five adults and an unborn child. The Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh news anchor had been with WTAE for 18 years. She wrote, she wrote they, are they are young black men, men likely in their teens or in their early 20s. They have, they have multiple, multiple siblings from multiple fathers and their mothers work multiple jobs. jobs. They, they know the police. They've, they've been arrested. Been arrested. In, announcing in announcing her firing, her parent company Hearst, Hearst Television said that, said that the comments were inconsistent, inconsistent with the company's ethics and journalistic standards and that it showed an egregious lack of judgment. She apologized, she apologized for her hypothetical suspects and said her comments could be viewed as racist. Bell, Bell also, also said that she did not get a fair shake in the situation, and the, and the story was about African Americans being killed by other African Americans. So here is a good example of context. So this is an o Emmy, multiple Emmy Award 21, winning. 21. She won 21, 21 Emmys, Emmys in 18 years. 18 years on the job. Really an upstanding reporter. She made this mistake, this statement, which went out there outside of context. Again, context doesn't exist in this instance. Um, and it would be hard to explain away, but um, she wasn't even allowed the opportunity. And part of that is because of public outcry. So once this is out there and the public has the opportunity to react, again, because of the internet, much faster and much more broadly um, reacted than previously in our history, uh, the effects on the company or what was the pressure brought to bear against the company made them make this decision. And they just decided that termination was the best alternative. And there have been many instances of this. There was, a couple of years ago, there was a short video clip that made it onto the internet. It was on YouTube and a couple of other places. It was a CEO of a Canadian company. And it was him standing in an elevator. So somebody had gotten the elevator tape. And he had a puppy in the elevator with him, and he kicked the puppy, brutally kicked the puppy. It went viral, which means it went all over the world. Within two weeks, there was so much pressure on this company that his board of directors fired him. Just like that. One act, one statement, one small thing. So you have to wonder, but you also have to know how important it is um, that we think about what we are saying and how we are interacting with one another social contract. So outside even though of all of the legal interpretation and the laws and other things, we are also bound together to one another through social norms, language norms, and a social contract. And a social contract is where we all agree that there's a set, an unspoken set of rules and, and ways that we will interact that we accept when we live together in a society. And those are fluid and they change, much like the laws do, um, but that social contract does exist. So, and we also have you know, the consequences that we just were talking about and criticism, being criticized for the things that we say are our actions. And we decide together what it is we will tolerate or not tolerate, should tolerate or, or shouldn't tolerate as a community and as a society. And if you think about um, the words that are used for describing different races, and think for yourself just how much those have changed even in your own lifetime, how those words have changed and what has become unacceptable and what is the new acceptable. And if you think about globalization and how fast we are growing and how diversified we are becoming, those things are changing faster and faster. And it's hard to keep up sometimes with social norms and common language. Um, but that is part of what we do when we agree to become part of the social contract. Um. 
<laughs> so uh, the Diversity Council is very concerned about why we edit our language, um, how to be more inclusive and diverse when it comes to uh, having conversations and um, interacting with other groups that are not your own. Studies have shown that it actually takes more um, practice for people to be empathetic towards others who are not like them. So you actually have to really work at it to like someone that's not like you. So um, we always kind of talk about uh, why we discuss biases and prejudices and discrimination. When you think about acts of violence or acts of um, threat, threatening acts, uh, ideas of genocide, right? It doesn't just start overnight, right? All, one day you wake up and genocide has happened. No, it starts with small acts of biases, stereotypes, jokes, um, accepting negative information about a group and rejecting positive information about that group. And that starts with just biases. And then we have our prejudices, right? Um, that uh, we target a group and basically use that group to uh, exclude memberships out of, out of groups or organizations. Right? Um, which moves to acts of discrimination. So biases and prejudices are things that, ha that we think about. Um, and we'll always have biases and prejudices. But it, it is up to us to decide if we want to allow those biases and prejudices to uh, decide for us how we're going to interact with people um, to the point of discriminating against them, right? Uh, if that's uh, creating different bath bathrooms for them. So. It's important for us to understand what the definitions of diversity and inclusion are. Because we talk about diversity a lot, but mostly um, I think that what most people don't understand that diversity is, is, a, is basically uh, how we are different and unique amongst all of us. Um, and that is a concept. And also, for example, it's inviting, getting invited to a party. But the Diversity Council really is in more concerned about moving towards inclusion and not just being diverse for diversity's sake, which happens a lot, right? You can be welcoming, but you might not be inclusive. So being inclusive means using all our differences to um, uh, enforce our resources and to make everything work better. Work better. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so simple, isn't it? Um, it's an action. It's something you have to do. So it's going to the party and being asked to dance, or being the host of the party and asking someone to dance, right? So that's the idea of really moving towards inclusion and not just being diverse. So we talked about this a little bit just a moment ago, but Language matters because our culture is changing, because our societies are changing. We have five generations in the workplace, unprecedented really in American history to have five generations in the workplace at once. Imagine the generational differences and the diversity that that creates, but also globalization and the fact that there are people now sharing um, hometowns and communities that never have before and exchanging different cultural aspects of themselves um, that have never been brought to bear before. And then realizing that there's so much potential within that for really latching on to innovative ideas, capturing new thoughts, and moving forward in creative ways. So those are some of the things that make valuing lang our language important. Oh, okay. um, and also, it's just the right thing to do, uh, to be inclusive of others, right? I mean, I can go all into it, but, <laughs> but we know, right, we're all here to learn and understand. So I would imagine um, that we know that we want to do the right thing. So when we talk about um, differences, we always kind of think about the inner circle. Uh, the, all the protected classes. So uh, diversity isn't just race, uh, national origin, and, and ethnicity, but I think a lot of people focus on that. It's, a, it's about gender and age discrimination, um, how we identify ourselves, uh, 
and also the religion that we, we, we worship, how we worship, what we believe, our income, our level of, of education, which is also on the outside. We forget that things are intersected, right? That poverty and, and race actually go together. Um, you want anything else? Yeah. So I think the purpose of the diversity wheel is just to show that there are so many different considerations and that no one person is one of these things. We all have multiple facets um, that truly make us different and distinct. And so there are challenges when we group ourselves and um, particularly into racial or ethnic categories or age categories. There are vast differences um, that exist in all of the different demographic groups and, and age groups depending on all of these other factors. Where did you grow up? Was it urban? Was it rural? Um, were you wealthy? Were you not wealthy? Uh, what, you know, were you religious? Were you spiritual? Um, what type of a family unit did you grow up in? Were there lots of siblings? Were you raised by your grandparents? All of those things that factor into making each one of us different and unique. Mm -hmm. Great, great. You're next. Oh. You're next. Oh. So another layer of that is how we actually think about difference when we encounter it and what kind of strategies we employ, how we utilize our thought process and our, and our thought methodology when we encounter difference. And there are two, you know, these are really, you know, stark contrasting methodologies and everyone falls somewhere in between. But the first is to really have a to believe that your, your intelligence is static, that you've learned what you need to learn, you know what you need to know. Um, when you encounter someone, you're uh, not likely to um, value their opinion as much as you might your own or as much as you might value the opinion of someone who's closely um, related to you or is very like you. Um, that you might feel threatened by their difference and you might uh, not want to engage that difference and stretch yourself and, to, and understand um, where, where the other person is coming from. The other is a growth mindset, and that is the belief that intelligence is fluid and that we can always grow, we can always adapt. The more that we do that, the more open we are, in fact, to growing and changing and improving uh, as we encounter difference and encounter one another. And the result of that um, is proven to be higher levels of achievement and that it gives a greater sense of free will when you are open to things, you, are, you feel more free to make your own determinations and create your own opinions. Oh, so this, uh, this is used uh, mostly uh, in, educa in education and academia. Has anybody heard of the mindsets? Of course. Yes, the, ed the educators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, so they use, they're using this um, to help close the achievement gap um, in schools. Uh, not as many schools, I think, have gotten there yet because I, we, there, I think there's still um, educators that believe that if you, you're born smart, then you're smart, that you can't become smart. And I think that we all have the ability to stretch our minds and be able to be better than we, we were yesterday, right? Plus, as you pointed out, we, you know, once you're in the system, you tend to believe those things about yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm not smart. I'm not... I'm going to do well in math. I'm not going to, you know, you kind of internalize all of the things that you hear um, and then you end up with the fixed mindset that I've, I've, my growth potential is predetermined and this is, you know, the path that I'm on just based on my mental capability. So when it comes to communication, people have this idea of, well, Bob tells these racist jokes and, but we're not going to say anything to Bob because that's just how Bob is. Right? So we, I've already kind of put on Bob that he doesn't have the ability to change and grow, but I'm not even addressing it with him. I'm not talking to him about it. That maybe Bob does want to know that his joke is racist, or he doesn't know that, that maybe it's not funny, because I wouldn't want to go around and keep telling a funny joke, and nobody's telling me that. Right? So the idea of intent and impact. 
So communication goes really well when the intent and impact match, right? So, but communication doesn't work well when the intent and impact don't match. And sometimes um, that happens when there's a misunderstanding, right? So your filters may be different uh, because of your skills and knowledge, your education, or your per personal historic context. So people who are mar marginalized might have different um, triggers when it comes to conversations with people. So you might hear that happen a lot, where somebody says, well, what you said was really offensive. And you wonder, like, what? I didn't mean that. I didn't mean it to sound that way. Uh, that's not what I meant. It might not be what you meant, but the impact is still the same, right? So good intent does not sanitize bad impact. Do you, should I do my, your, my example? Or your yeah, example? go ahead. So, when I first started at the Diversity Council in 2011, um, my boss at the time had sent me all over the place to go sit on um, boards and committees. Uh, so I walked on into this committee, uh, and we were making a decision about youth, uh, uh, having a youth conference here in southeast Minnesota. And we were talking about themes. Uh, and I was sitting there, and we were doing all this stuff. And then at the end of the meeting, the person that was convening it or hosting the meeting came up to me and said, Vanjie, you are so eloquent for whatever it may be, whatever you want to put in the blank there, right? For my age, for my ethnicity. Yeah, for what? <laughs> for what? Yeah. Right? Um, I'm not that young. I'm actually in my 40s. Uh, so I was really kind of bothered by, I didn't really say anything to her uh, when she said that, but I was really kind of bothered by it. I, I wouldn't be in this position if I wasn't qualified, if I wasn't able to um, talk about my thoughts and ideas to other people, right? So... So you left it without the So I left without uh, addressing it. And I will tell you, it's been five years, and I have not worked with that person since then. <laughs> so so, so you intent. left it un unmanaged. Though. Yeah, so I left it unmanaged. And that's on me, right? So I should have addressed it with the person. And I really actually did think about it. I was going to email her the next day and say something about it, but I didn't. I was new, so I wasn't really sure how I was going to be... Um, how is it going to be taken, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that, the responsibility about both people, uh, the giver and the receiver. So I have another example of that, and this is a situation where my husband was introducing me to two people, and he said, they are from China. And so I w met, they're both students, and so I went to meet these folks, and I shook hands with the, oh, and he had said about the gentleman, he doesn't speak very, you know, his English isn't very clear. So be conscious of that. So I shook hands and we said hello. And then I turned to the, the woman, Lynn, and we shook hands and she said, oh, it's so very nice to meet you. And I said, your English is wonderful. And she said, well, I've lived in Texas since I was 10, so I would hope that I can speak English well. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you told me that. I didn't have that piece of information. You know, I apologize for misinterpreting you know, tell me about Texas and what did you do? And so I opted to say something because she had opted to say something to me. She had said, she could have said, oh, thank you, or then offended. But instead she said, I've lived in, you know, the United States since I was 10. And that gave me the opportunity to say thank you to her. Thank you. I just was able to learn something and change my tone and now we can build a relationship whereas that five years later it might be hard to <laughs> address that well, if I saw her I'd probably say something but yeah. um so the feedback loop is really important uh, for us we're not very good at taking uh, feedback or uh, criticism right? right even if it's constructive or positive con uh, criticism and the responsibility lays on both sides of the conversation both people have um, a responsibility or have the opportunity to change the outcome of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So Lynn was able to say something yes. to D um, and fix that and rectify the situation. So now they're still friends. They're, they're able to have this relationship. Um, but if that didn't happen, if Lynn didn't speak up, then Lynn would have walked away thinking, oh God, D's kind of you know, insensitive yeah. or yeah. whatever. So here's an, another example. Uh, it, Lynn, again, uh, <laughs> she's at the staff lounge 
And Dee and I are talking about this country music uh, concert that we went to and how wonderful it was. And then um, noticing that Lynn's there, we say, oh, gosh, you know, it, because it was country music, we didn't think to invite you. Mm -hmm. And Lynn very calmly says, well, you know, I like lots of different kinds of music and my race really doesn't have anything to do with it. To which we say, of course it doesn't. I don't know why we assumed your race would have something to do with it. Thank you again for allowing us to kind of change. And next time we go, um, we'll be able to, to invite you. Rather than saying, when Lynn says, um, you know, I like lots of different music and my race doesn't have anything to do with it, that's the time when we feel offended or ashamed and we say, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, wasn't trying to offend you. And that can be a conversation stopper. So opening the conversation um, using thank you. Thank you works in so many places where we tend to use I'm sorry. Um, so think about that. But it, it's a nice way to build a relationship and think relationship rather than um, that you've just been corrected and it doesn't feel very good to be yeah, corrected. Staying on the positive. It's moving away from the negative of, oh, I'm sorry, and then let's move on. But like, thank you. That's information that I didn't have before. Let's talk about that. Let's learn something new about each other, right? and being able to have more conversation, having a deeper conversation. Minnesotans are really great at talking about weather for three <laughs> hours, but what, about, what are we gonna talk about after that, right? So identifying our own biases, how do we do that? So some of the barriers of inclusion have a lot to do with our individual implicit biases, things that, we, that just kind of happen, right? Um, Barack Obama said his, grandmo his grandmother, uh, if she saw a black man uh, walking down the street, that she would clutch her purse. And I didn't really, I, when he, I heard him say that, I was kind of flabbergasted. Like, wow, he would actually admit to that? that he would say that about his mother? But he was kind of talking about what are some of our implicit biases are, that sometimes we don't have control over some of the ways that we act, even though her grandson is half black. So... But also, we want to talk about institutional types of um, barriers. barriers, right? So organization, organizational culture or practices and policies that advantage some groups and disadvantage others, which also leads to internal biases of ourselves, Oops. which creates <laughs> self-hate and, and hurt our self-image. But it happens a lot, right? We have a lot of negative... Uh, uh, recordings that go through our head that can be reaffirmed basically by what we see and the stereotypes in, in, in the media, right? Um, and we do tend to internalize things that we hear about ourselves, um, whether they're things that have to do with being female or male or things that have to do with, you know, um, a couple of the most common ones that we think of are that boys are supposed to be tougher, they're not supposed to show emotion. Um, Girls are supposed, women, girls, females are supposed to be more uh, sensitive. It's okay for them to show emotion. We internalize these things, and they in turn affect our behavior and how we interact with them, one another. But all three of them work together uh, in concert for us to build those barriers of misunderstanding and lack of inclusion, right? And these when are the things we want to be aware of when we're having conversations and when we're encountering difference and when we're reading, you know, stories in the media about... Um, conversations that are going on elsewhere or uh, things that are serious and what are some of the things that play into those and what what lens are we looking at um, a situation through yeah if we think of politics of like how divisive politics are you know so if you don't believe in the things that I I I don't believe in or I believe then we can't talk we can't have a conversation and we're on these polar opposite sides uh, so we've kind of moved away from having civil uh, discourse towards just disagreeing with each other and not having conversations. When we really can, I think it's really important to hear the opposite side, the other side, so we can um, really have more information to make better decisions. So this was written, this was submitted to the Diversity Council by a woman who had this interaction and had written it out. And I'm going to read it, but you have it in front of you as well. A southern white woman is an event coordinator working with an African-American minister. They end up talking about a mutual acquaintance who is known to be persistent and driven. Without thinking, the woman writes, I uttered a phrase I grew up hearing. Yeah, he's a real slave driver. 
As soon as it was out of my mouth, I realized for the first time the source and meaning of the phrase. I was ashamed and bewildered and wanted to apologize. Before I, but before she can say anything, the minister, looking her in the eye, quickly replies, yes, he's a real taskmaster. She agrees and later thanks him for his kindness and subtle but important education. The result, in her words, I haven't used the term slave driver again. So sometimes it does take that context um, and it does take um, a particular interchange to realize um, the impact of language that we use. Would it have had the same impact in another situation? Maybe not. But that doesn't mean it wasn't impacting um, people that she had used the word in front of before without her realizing. Um, that it was offensive. So we're wondering if anyone else in the room has had a similar situation or can think of an instance when they had to challenge their own use of language uh, because of the context or um, because someone pointed out to them, even in so subtle a way, um, that the term might be offensive. Anyone think of anything? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you mind if I just repeat what you said? So she has a friend who is married to a, gen a First Nation gentleman, and she realized that in his presence they had frequently used the phrase low man on the totem pole which is an offensive thing because it dishonors what the totem pole is in their culture, which is a very beautiful and symbolic thing with a lot of um, spiritual meaning and tribal meaning. Um, and so it, it, at some point you realized that it was probably offensive and you shouldn't use it. Well, it's the perpetuation of uh, uh, negative stereotypes, mm -hmm. right? Using symbols that were good things for certain cultures and making them negative. Right. Yeah. And or in a, this example is the opposite. It's something that's um, a very negative thing, but a very Im profound. Slavery was a very profound and impactful thing. And to minimize it by calling your boss someone a slave driver, well, that minimizes the experience of a slave and, and what a slave actually went through um, to say, well, you know, she's just a slave driver. Really? So she deprives them of liberty and food and clothing and the rights to their own name and their own culture. So, um, but it can go either way. Anyone else have an example? Yes. Like, uh, I, uh, I was born here, but my parents are from Greece. And people still, they ask me, they said, well, how long have you been in this country? <laughs> yes. Have a name of a register. So if everyone didn't hear that, his, he was born here, but his parents were born in Greece. But people will still say to him, oh, how long have you been in this country? And he's a, actually a native of Rochester, but um, still carried because of the name, I'm assuming, is part of that. Another example is Obama. Was, he was born in L.A., which is part of the United States. A lot of people think that he's uh, from a different country. Right, right. And sometimes we can be deliberately obtuse about things um, and deliberately hurtful. So knowing that a term that you might be using or a thought that you might be perpetuating, a bias that you might be perpetuating, knowing that that's hurtful um, is, is doubly bad. So, not, uh, it, so recognizing it but not correcting the behavior is doubly yeah, bad. <laughs> yes. Because that kind of thing stings. When you're on the receiving end, it can be, mm -hmm. it can be painful. Okay, so we're going to go on from there to microaggressions. Anyone heard of microaggressions previously? Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of a relatively new terminology, but Vanjie will explain yeah. it. Yes, it's uh, insidious things. Those uh, yes. day-to-day, those, day, those, day -day, those small little in, uh, insults or, or comments that people make that kind of chip away at um, who you are as a person, right? If, if it is uh, historically marginalized people who are thought of as criminals or thugs, right? Um, just because of the color of their skin uh, and how they're portrayed in the media when you think about it. So some people are uh, lone wolves versus th thugs, right? And they're both committed the same crime but may have different skin color. 
So um, there's three different types of microaggressions. One is a microassault, which is a blatant verbal, nonverbal, uh, or environmental attack intended to convey discriminatory and biased sentiment. An example is, where are you from? How long have you been in this country? So that's one of, one of them. The idea that you're foreign, that you're not from here, automatically stating like, you don't look like you're from Rochester, so you must be from somewhere else. Right? So the micro insult, unintentional behaviors or verbal comments that convey rudeness or insensitivity or demean a person's racial heritage, identity, gender identity, or sexuality. So this is kind of a, uh, uh, an example from a, a, a training that we did with someone who's very tall. She's over six feet tall. And so typically that most women are not six feet tall, but her co-workers and would, were telling her, why do you wear high heels? You're already tall enough. And so it really kind of bothered her. Uh, because it implied that there's she shouldn't be able to wear high, high heels. heels because she's tall. So the, here's these beautiful fashionable high heels in her favorite color, but those should be off limits to her because she's tall. But the idea that she should come down to their level, that there's no way that she's going to be short, and she, <laughs> so she can't do that. But don't, you don't, you dare wear high heels and be any taller than you are, right? Mm -hmm. So micro-invalidation, which is the next one, and this I think happens a lot. Um, the verbal comments or behaviors that exclude, negate, or dismiss the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a target group. So when somebody comes to you and say, oh, I went to Hy-Vee, and um, I, went, I wanted to go get these cantaloupes that were on sale, and there, there weren't any more cantaloupes, and I asked the person to go get them for me, and they were really rude. But some other woman came and asked for the cantaloupes, and he went and he helped her right away. So I don't know. Why he didn't help me is it because I'm tall? And, and, my, and I tell Dee, Dee this, and Dee says, oh, my God, that didn't happen to you. There's a smile in every aisle. They wouldn't be do, rude to you. Or they didn't mean that. They That's didn't not mean what they that. meant. You're reading too much into it. I, I think they just didn't see you, right? right. So even though we think that it, that's harmless, it actually isn't because we're invalidating a person's experience because you weren't there, they were, so they know what happened. And, and how even, it made them feel, yeah, which even is if, always valid. Which is, if you even think it's ridiculous, you shouldn't really tell them it's ridiculous. You can just listen to what they have to say because when it comes down to it, they felt safe to tell you something, that something happened to them. Yeah. I had an email today about, you know, one of these bad things we saw on Facebook. Five things never to say to a person who's losing weight. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them really amazed me. It was, gee, you look terrific. Which could be interpreted as me, well, how did I look before? before? Right. I didn't look terrific right. before. Or else, <laughs> I, I got to keep up with this and it leads to eating disorder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I kind of would think that was oversensitive. Mm -hmm. but the, yeah, it could so be. Some I people may view that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that intent and impact yeah. piece yeah. again. Because right. it could have been like the fifth thing, like the fifth time that you heard that. Like, I've had 10 people already ask me where I'm from. And now you're the 11th person. I'm going like, to go off on you. <laughs> right? So can we do the hotel example? Oh. Because it kind of is a micro insult and a micro, <laughs> micro invalidation. So yeah, I'm going to this hotel because I'm doing a training. I'm putting on a training for this organization. Um, I'm going to go walk up to the to the front desk person, he, said, he sees me and says, oh, how can I help you? I said, well, I'm here for a training. He's like, oh, housekeeping? It's on the second floor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and he said, no, I'm giving the training. And so she comes to tell me the story. And I'm like, well, you know, Van, he's probably the only training they had to offer. You know, I, I'm certain he wasn't trying to insult you. So then she was invalidated <laughs> on top of being. <laughs> And I just thought I, I thought it was funny, and I, I shared it with people. Um, so you can take it however you want. I can take it however I want. If I was really having a bad day, I probably would have been like pissed off. Like, really, do I look like housekeeping? <laughs> I'm like, see, sí, senor, housekeeping. So <laughs> yes, go ahead. So if you if you invalidated her 
Right. No, no, no. Again, the, no. I think the most important thing is to just listen yeah. and, and say, oh, how did that make you feel? Not like a but, therapist, but, oh, but you know. But the idea of being, are we being too insensitive, right? Too Maybe overly sensitive. Too overly sensitive. sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, of course, I mean, lots of, lots of these things happen to me on, on a regular, right? So I've gotten to a point where I'm, I have to decide, like, how am I going to deal with these these microaggressions. Um, am I going to have conversations with every single person? I mean, it is my job, but <laughs> I don't have enough time in the day for me to deal with that. But I can look at it as opportunities and also knowing that there is still a lot of work to do out there and that it, and when I can have a conversation, I will have a conversation. If I wasn't running late, I might have would have said something to him. So. I wasn't running that late. <laughs> so we thought you would enjoy this. This is, um, this is another example of a microaggression. Yeah, and we, we think you'll enjoy it. Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Nice day. Nice day, huh? Yeah. Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no, uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Shasina. <laughs> there's, a really There's a really good teriyaki, good teriyaki barbecue, barbecue, barbecue place near my apartment. I actually, so, really, I actually like really like kimchi. Cool. cool. What about, what about you? you? Where are you from? San Francisco. San Francisco. But, where but where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? really? You're Native American? No. No, uh, just regular, regular American. Regular American. <laughs> oh, well, oh, well uh, I, guess I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, oh well, well. I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? Really? I'm weird? Must be a Korean thing. Okay. I think the intent and impact didn't match. <laughs> Go to the next slide, will you? So, but by showing you this, we don't want to discourage you from being curious. We, we believe in our hearts that the first response to difference should be curiosity. We should wonder about one another, but we need to temper that curiosity with respect and be respectful. So kind of getting to the point of, um, you know, how do you manage the conversation? And some of it is reading kind of in your heart, and I think Vanjie would say, you know, you can kind of tell where somebody's really coming from. Are they trying to be disrespectful? Do they mean to be rude? And I don't think this young man necessarily meant to be. He just wasn't very cued in to how to ask respectfully. He was impolite about it. So when is as important as how? If you think about every interaction, as a potential to build a relationship, then the first question you're going to ask someone is not, where are you from? Because that immediately implies, you look different than me, or you sound different than me, or you can't be from where I'm from. But you should ask that question when, you, when it fits into the conversation. And then if the response is San Diego, then accept that as the response. Don't assume that there's something more. Or ask the question that you want to ask. And I know Vanjie and I have talked about this numerous times. If the question you, your, if your curiosity is about a person's ethnicity, then ask that question. But do it at the right point in the relationship. So again, not the first question out of your mouth, but once you've developed a rapport, then it's good to ask, where are you from? Which at that point means, tell me something about yourself. Tell me something about who you are and how you got to be where you are. So it's about relationship and dignity, and then asking with respect. So 
know. <laughs> We're just going to stare at each other. <laughs> well, I think what it, um, when it really comes down to it, it is that I want to believe, and you say this too, Dee, that you believe that everybody has good intent, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you have good intent until you don't. So for the most part, I don't really think that people are out there trying to be offensive, unless you're on Facebook and you're arguing about something. And nobody can <laughs> see you. <laughs> um, but when it comes to like in personal interactions with people or just relationships, I mean, we, this is all about how we interact and how we have relationships with people and how we can have better relationships with people and also how to get over misunderstandings, right? Because it happens all the time. And I've said this before, I think we're not very good communicators right. when it comes down to it. And we downplay the importance of language in our communications. And we tend to be defensive of the way we've always spoken or um, the things that, the way we learn to communicate rather than being willing to modulate our language to be more inviting and mm -hmm. more welcoming and to build relationships better. Well, it's the idea that I don't really think of it as censoring. I, I don't think that just because somebody says, hey, Vanjie, um, I kind of think that was a little of offensive or insensitive. Like, okay, well, good. Let, why, why do you think so? Let's talk about this. Um, and if, if I think, like, well, if this is really going to hurt someone, I'm not going to do it again. It's the same reason why I work in schools with youth and I don't swear like a sailor when I'm in classrooms, right? So it's all about context, um, where I'm at. I, I will... Uh, taper my language depending on who my audience is, right? And social norms and how, what is acceptable and realizing that we need to continue to change and to, to modulate what is acceptable and the way that we talk to one another as new people join us, as five generations are found together mm -hmm. in the workplace. Um, there, it's important for everyone on, on all sides to consider how language is important. And it has very little to do with the First Amendment which really is the relationship between government and an, the individual, and whether the government should have any role in filtering or censoring what we say. So when people say being PC is taking away my right to free speech, what they're really saying is, I'm not sure I understand how the Constitution works <laughs> and what that has to do with how I interact respectfully with others. Also, I really don't want to have to deal with the consequences of what I've just said. So I'm going to use the Constitution yeah. Yeah. to protect what yeah. I just said. That may offend you. So yeah. there's also that side to it, too. Anyone else have a personal experience they'd like to share with us? We have a microphone, too. In the back. Yes. In the back. Well, you've certainly given us some more, more um, vocabulary words. You started out in the beginning by saying, um, People tend to uh, speak uh, based upon the people they associate with. I've, I think people are just plain rude. I, 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 I don't care all this explanation you have, they're just rude. That they don't stop and think about the words that come out of their mouths. Now, this is an election year, and I would recommend when you see, meet somebody say, are you registered to vote? <laughs> If you're not registered to vote, I'd like to help you. I'd like to tell you where you can go to vote. I'd like to tell you what days you can reg uh, vote absentee ballot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If, that, if you think that's being rude, okay, it's being rude, but that's what I would do. <laughs> you're right, and, and voting is, of course, one of the best ways we have to exercise our voice. And as long as you're not coupling that with a conversation of who to vote for, <laughs> then, then that's a very viable conversation to have. Absolutely. I believe I heard something about swearing like a sailor and as a sailor. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, I was waiting. Yes. I was waiting Sorry. to hear if somebody was going to say that. Yes. <laughs> See? Generalization. We shouldn't have said do that. Sa yes. Do you sailors swear a lot since you are a sailor? Not all of them, right? <laughs> Not all. No. Oh. <laughs> right there? Here? I like oh, yeah. your story about the hotel thought. And my thought is it seems like that person was probably just trying to be nice or in a hurry. And my, 
my thought is we're in too much of a hurry. Yeah. And he didn't give it enough thought on maybe what you were really asking for. Mm -hmm. For example, when you pull up to a stop sign, how long do you really stop? You're too busy to stop. You go. Or if, when you go from reverse to, to drive, do you really let it sit and adjust or do you just slam it and go? Mm -hmm. Our life is full of those types of things where you'll meet somebody and you're not really analyzing what they're doing or why they're there and you just quickly say something. Right. I think you just quickly said something. Yep. You're right. But then, like you said about rudeness, is there a sense that we should be taking the time and yeah, you thinking stop, first? Stop yeah. yeah. We had an experience just last night, Ginny and I, this is Ginny, my daughter-in-law in the front. We were at a store and there was a young man on the register and he, the first words out of his mouth when he finally looked at us were, I, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm, I've had it. And we said, has it been a long shift? Yes, I've been here too long. The, the group of customers in front of us um, were speaking a different language. And the next thing he said to us was, I can't hear through the gibberish. Which was shocking to hear him say. And, and not, I think, what he meant. Um, but he, you know, first of all, being young and probably not thinking about the impact that that would have on someone else. Um, but also the context of being in a rush, trying to get off the register and being just worn out, um, that's what came out of his mouth. I think when we take shortcuts, um, we become rude. Because uh, then we, our own self-importance comes into play, right? I'm too busy, I don't have time, I just need to address this right now. Uh, when we talk about electronic uh, communication, sometimes there's a lot of misunderstanding if you text. Or if you have people that text you and you tell them, call me, but they won't. They just keep texting you <laughs> and then they don't put punctuations and you're not even really sure what they're trying to tell you. So there's a lot of misunderstanding with that, <laughs> right? That happens. I think there was somebody, oh yeah. The thing is uh, individual rights and almost versus common good. I don't mm -hmm. know that it always has to be either or, but there's a common sure. ba uh, balance in there and an individual right of free speech. I have that right for free speech. So I was thinking as you were presenting there and you talked about bias and prejudice and discrimination. So from this, if we examine our own biases and prejudices and how does that build to the common good of building a community of respect, mm -hmm. that's where I think where that bridge comes. Absolutely, that know, social contract is the common good. It's the way that we agree to work to, to talk to one another and to live together. And you know, the, the slippery slope that you don't start at genocide, it really does start with allowing types of speech that we might not have before, and, and then that enters the mainstream. So if you think about um, the illegal immigrant or the undocumented persons um, issue and where that has been, that moved from total respect to hosts on evening news shows using racial slurs or derogatory comments about that population. How did we allow it to get to that point? And then from that point you move to, you know, to discrimination and, and then it's easier and easier to move up the ladder until suddenly um, we have created a new us and them and we've demonized the them. I think the challenge is, as this gentleman mentioned here, the example of your hotel experience, that there is, I mean, if I think about all this, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, how many times have I said something and not even thought twice of it? Yeah. And then it puts you on edge to think, oh, my gosh, I've got a lot of other things. And I think that happens for so many that it, if it's up front and center, it's just these kind of conversations that allow us that time to reflect and be reflective and think, I've got to pay attention to this and not putting up that barrier to say, I've had enough of this. I, I, right. I, I'm so overloaded with everything, and I think that's what happens. Yes. People are so overloaded that the gentleman that said, I can't understand all this gibberish, well, he's probably so overloaded, right. and it's like, I don't mean to be a, but what else am I supposed to do? Right. So I think there's that context of understanding um, among people to and see that piece. And that's stress that it's both sides of the conversation as well. And, you know, so if you do say something that you've said a million times and you don't realize that it's offensive and someone says to you, oh, you know, that's, that's kind of offensive and here's why, 
that is the opportunity to change. I don't think you need to constantly um, be as, uh, you know, be worried at that stress level, but so that there's that opportunity when it does arise to learn and, and modulate and change the way we think of talk. I think there's a humor to it, too, and I appreciate yes. Bob pointing out to say, you know what, I might have been a drunken sailor, but you know what, who cares? I still am. You know, let's yeah. have a little yeah, lightness absolutely. to it, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, this Not is a, also yeah. it's our job to modulate what we say and speak, um, and so we do this on a regular basis, and we're practicing all the time. And so we we allow you to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. We make mistakes, even. Yeah, look um, at our poor friend, time. Lynn. <laughs> look at Lynn. <laughs> poor Lynn. <laughs> so uh, that you can make mistakes, and it's okay, and that we can move forward. And that's what we're hoping can happen, because sometimes conversations just end, and, and misunderstandings continue to perpetuate. So I'm hoping that maybe we can make those mistakes and move forward and talk about it. Um, I, first of all, I'll just okay, I'll, on, I'll just make a comment. He didn't say drunken sailor. He said swearing like a sailor. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you added a whole new area. He's a drunken drunken swearing sailor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, so my question is, when you're talking about the lowest level and sort of the tiny comments that, or comments in the crowd, how, how do you sort of name them? I feel obligated sometimes to use my white privilege for good and not evil. And yeah. so it's like, and, and sometimes I'm the person who calls it out and I'll say, boy, you know, that was really insensitive to all the women in the room, both right. of us, <laughs> but, you, know, I, you know, and so, so I just, if there's a, a lovely way, like instead of saying I'm sorry, saying thank you, if you could speak to that, I would really appreciate that. I do agree that humor is, is frequently, you know, a good way to do it, um, and I would rarely say do it in front of a group of people, um, because again, it's relationship building, so you know, if you're offended by, let's say, a joke at a party, and you say to the person later, wow, you know, I'm not sure you should use that in mixed company, and you probably shouldn't use it at all, which is kind of the humor part. Um, and here's why. It's offensive, and, you know, it kind of shows that you're a little bit insensitive to, to where women are. Um, I think humor is very powerful, but I, and I, but I do think just directly, just saying, hey, that's, that was a little strange. Whether or not you were the person that, you know, I know there's a gentleman up here, too. Was it right here? You talked oh. about implicit bias. And I view that as being very difficult for each of us individually to understand what our implicit biases are. So my question is, are there any techniques or tools available to us to help us identify our own implicit biases? Yeah, there's actually a test that you can take. It's on the Harvard website. Yeah. Um, and we can uh, send it and have it sent out to you. Are you, are you all on, are they on, a, yeah. on the email? Um, and it's used by organizations and individuals, and it really does give you a picture of your own bias. Check, check your implicit biases. Yeah. But wait, wait, we have over here. Yeah. She has yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I was at a workshop a number of years ago uh, presented by a wonderful woman from another country, different ethnicity, and she related how she would receive very negative comments and so finally she started saying may I tell you why I find that statement hurtful and it immediately removed the defensiveness <laughs> of the speaker but it also called attention to their statement that it wasn't acceptable and I really felt that was a very very helpful tool that if, a, if someone says something you can just respond in that way and it's not attacking them it's just saying <laughs> I find that hurtful Yes. So I think that's a good, uh, it was a good reminder. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So using an I statement rather than a you statement you're, is, you're is You're being a good offensive. Tool. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you just uh, come from a place of respect and a, a place of love, I think that you can address those things without getting people to be too defensive. And, oh, really? Oh, oh I, didn't, I didn't know that. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Um, okay. But sometimes I think when we're calling people out, we're like, 
that was really offensive. No, don't do that. <laughs> I, the comment I have is, uh, uh, we're going through a transition into a, a very integrated society now. And my wife and I, we have technical backgrounds. And in the 60s, we were working in Virginia. And we were working on a Navy base. We worked with people of color. And as far as I know, we've treated them like equals. You know, there was no problem there. But as soon as they walked off that Navy base, uh, it was a different society entirely for them. And I, the color of somebody's skin, may, I don't think, makes any difference to either of us. And maybe we're offensive in some respects, but we certainly don't intend to be. No, definitely true. And that, I've heard that story before from a lot of people who were in the military back in the 60s and 70s that when they were with them on base, it was, they were all the same, but when they were off the base, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also from technical background in the 60s, 70s, and uh, I find the term mixed company offensive <laughs> because that was used quite a bit mm -hmm. when the guys wanted to tell an off-color joke or sure. something, mm -hmm. and it singles you out. Absolutely. Yeah. In any company is what you should say. That should be offensive. You shouldn't tell that joke in any company. <laughs> Just don't tell that joke. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of humor, um, so much of the media, and if you go to any of the comedy clubs and whatever, the stand-up comedians, basically, I've walked out of them before, they are inevitably putting some group down to make, like that's humorous. And the people in the audience are, oh yeah, ha ha ha, like it doesn't matter. How can we as a culture get over that, that it does matter? whether it's in a comedy setting or any other way, as soon as you start putting one group down, whether it's blondes who can't change a light bulb or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't even know how to approach that. I think it's hard to find humor that's, unless it's self-directed that isn't putting someone down. And even the self-directed humor is frequently putting, you know, the, the comedian is putting themselves down as part of a group, either their maleness or their, you know, ethnicity or whatever it happens to be well I just think that's lazy comedy yeah. because I think you can have lots of good comedy without having to um, insult a group of people but it happens more often than not when you kind of go to like those amateur comedy clubs but yeah, when you see it like you see satire um, and and they kind of make jokes of the everyday stuff and, and I think in a very tasteful way but kind of bringing um, that the social, social commentary of like, this is kind of ridiculous, and why is this ridiculous? And let's talk about that instead of why this group is so awful and they can't change a light bulb. So, go ahead. I've been thinking that same thing for years with the com comedic aspect. Uh, it seems like society has to be funny and funnier all the time. All, that's all there is. You, you either have to be funny or cool, and, and language gets mixed up in that, trying to be one or the other. You say the wrong thing, you say stuff at work to be cool or to be funny, and it just goes on and on and on. It just never stops. And I, I don't understand, I guess, why you gotta eat, gotta be funny and so cool all the time. Why, why we're like that? I just don't. Because we want to fit into the group. Yep. Yeah. It's a sense of belonging. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of people use use humor um, to break uh, those bound boundaries that we have with each other. Like, hey, I'm gonna, you I want to meet you. Stuff. Yeah. And maybe we do. And that's how we learn to not say the wrong stuff all the time. Tomorrow you've got to be funnier than the other guy. So to address both of your inquiries and then to talk about tools, I'll talk about tools first. Everybody in here has strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So when we started talking about humor as an, as an effective tool for talking about issues, that might not be Everybody's, your strength. Yeah. You might be terrible at telling mm -hmm. jokes. So please don't tell me a joke if you're terrible at telling jokes. <laughs> but maybe, maybe you are really good at speaking 
with children because you're a grandmother, you're a grandfather, and you know how to take somebody aside and explain to them in a calm way mm -hmm. why something offended them. Use your strengths. And then if you need help, call the diversity council. We can help you. <laughs> we, we can do that. We can help you with that. Um, also, we with address regard, those things all the time. So. We do. We really do. You'd be surprised. Um, with regard to the comedy, um, two comics stand out in my brain when we think about insult, insulting a specific group. The first one was the bad one that we're talking about now. I don't know if you've ever heard of Carlos Mencia, um, but he has a very... Um, a very abrasive style that's very exclusion. It, it excludes people with disabilities, um, people of different races, but that's his style, and it is lazy comedy. Mm -hmm. But then you have people like Richard Pryor, who he would talk about race issues because it was the only way he was able to communicate to people that were not from his race about what he was going through. And if he would have spoke about it in a serious way, nobody would have been able to stomach it or to listen to it. So sometimes it's like Mary Poppins, right? A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. <laughs> Once again, it's all about how you use your tools. So whatever you're good at, use your tools, and you'll be okay. Err on the side of caution and make sure you listen more than you speak. Mm -hmm. I think listening is really important, yes. And take a, take a second, like what you said about that we don't, we don't take the time. We're so busy, we move, we move too quickly. That, Let's just take that extra second to pay attention to what's happening around us or, or that person that we're having a conversation with. I think that we don't appreciate the time that we have with each other and, have the, and the conversations that we're having with, with each other. I think it's really wonderful for me to be here with all of you. I'm very honored to be here with all of you because I do. I value and respect every single one of you and that the fact that you even came to listen to us tonight. And we do especially appreciate, this is the first time that Vanjie and I have presented anything together, so thank you for... Mm -hmm. Thank you for so being so patient with us. <laughs> you want to pick our... Uh, All right. All right, Vanjie, you pick one. Oh, door prize. And of course, I'm like, oh, Sue Iverson. That was an easy one without my glasses. <laughs> 